Well, it sounds as if, as if Captain Von Trapp in the video we just saw has chosen military discipline as his approved uh, manner of parenting style. And so maybe the military uh, discipline style is not the very best style that could be done out there, but that's the one that he chose. Now, throughout history, in all parts of the world, there is an amazing thing that has happened with children. And this has happened forever. And this is what it is is that children always grow up. They always grow up to be adults. And so even if they don't have parents, they still grow up. Even if they didn't have you, they would still grow up. And I hope that this will set you free a little bit to realize that children are all going to grow up one way or the other. But here is the amazing thing. You get this chance. You as the parents get this chance to influence them during this time that they're here under your care. And you get the amazing opportunity to influence them for good and to help them to grow and become all the wonderful human being that God created them and that was God's dream for them in the first place. So today we're going to talk about scream-free parenting. And my hope is that we can all learn some things about the whole process of this. Um, is it possible for kids to grow up without spending all of our time lecturing and yelling and screaming? I hope that's possible. Let's give it a try. So if you will, let's uh, open our bear notes and we're going to look together. At, this is where we're going to start today is number one, give them a sense of worth. Give them a sense of worth and value. Jesus invested confidence in people who, who had no confidence. Jesus believed in people who did not even believe in themselves. Jesus went around Galilee and Judea, and he was revoking the price tags of worthlessness that people felt about themselves, and he replaced them with price tags of value. Notice what it says in Romans 5 eight. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ considered all people to be so valuable, worth so much, that he was willing to give his life for them. Jesus affirms our children's value, and so we must as well. Did you know that you can just look at someone and you can raise the value of how they see themselves? Your, your words, your look, your time, all of those things have an effect on children as to how they see themselves and how they value themselves in the same way that God values them. In Ephesians 4, 29, it says, do not let any unwholesome word come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So put downs and sarcasm and comparing their bad qualities with the good personalities of every children uh, are not really helpful in helping them grow to be uh, full of worth and value as God intends for them. David Seamans uh, wrote about, he, he did this little point value thing about how the things that you say and the things that you do affect children in their heart like by a point value. So if you give a compliment to a child about something, that's a plus one, one point. If you criticize them, that's minus 10 points. But if you criticize them for who they are, their very personhood, that's minus 100 points. It takes a lot of things to overcome that. And you know that's true, don't you? Because most of you remember something from third grade when somebody said something really mean about you and you still remember that, but there have been thousands of compliments that have come your way and you've forgotten all of those, but you still remember that one thing from third grade because this point value thing has power. In Isaiah 43, here's, here's what God says about us. Because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior, I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt with rich Cush and Seba thrown in, that's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. This is how God feels about all his children. And so we as parents must communicate that to our kids so that they too could know how valuable and how precious they are to Jesus. Number one, give them a sense of worth. Let's look at number two. Provide space for learning responsibility. That's where we're going next, okay? Provide the space for learning responsibility. Let's talk about this one a little bit. Now, our goal for children is for, that they would grow up to be responsible adults and that they would love the Lord. 
Uh, one of our favorite verses about child rearing, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, personally, I, I wanted to be a dad from way back. I remember as a teenager, you know, thinking about, well, when I have kids, you know, how am I going to relate to them? And what is, I, I remember thinking, what is the goal of parenting? I mean, what, are, what is a parent supposed to do? You know, what's the, what's the job? And I thought, the only thing I had to go in, I thought it was discipline. That I'd heard that a lot over the years, you know, like um, that you discipline children so that when they become adults, they will have self-discipline. In fact, we often talk about parents as either strict or lenient. And those are discipline categories, you know, either strict discipline or lenient discipline. And those were the categories I was familiar with. But let me just say, as important as discipline is, that is not the key thing, because we all know some really, really bad people that are extremely disciplined, like Hitler, for example. I mean, there are lots of bad people, and actually what made them worse is that they were so disciplined in their badness, okay? So discipline is good. It's a really good category, but that's not the big picture. Now, so what is it that can help us in understanding kind of the big picture of, uh, of what it means to be an adult, to help children grow to adulthood, which is our job. I think what we really want, I'm not sure the exact words for this, but let me throw out these words, that we want them to be responsible decision makers, which will give them the ability to make great decisions in their life, like to love the Lord with all their hearts, like the decision to be kind and loving people, like the decision to establish positive relationships, like the decision to be whole people, independent before God. All this revolves around responsibility under God, around being separate, independent people who are are free to choose the right way to live their lives. That's what we want for our kids when they finally grow up. Uh, Sam Carmack, our founding pastor, Sam and Nancy and Peggy and I went on uh, multiple mission trips to the Yucatan uh, Peninsula to minister to the Mayan Indians. And um, also uh, his parents went with us one time and his mom had this great saying. She said, as parents, we spend the first few years of our lives tying them to our apron strings. And then we spend the rest of their lives trying to untie them and let them go free and let them become a whole fully uh, responsible adults. Now that's our challenge as parents. How do we set them up for success as adults Especially when they start off, when they're little, when they need so much, when they can't do anything by themselves and we have to do everything for them. How do we, how do we help them do that? Now, some parents are kind of like over-functioning parents, always swooping in to protect children from every danger and ultimately keeping kids from uh, learning how to protect themselves. Um, so I can't remember who this was, but somebody here at Bear Valley told me they had a relative who the mom and the daughter did their homework together every night, starting in first grade, okay? So first grade, well, all the way through high school, and then she went off to college. So what did the mom do? She bought the textbooks that her daughter had in college, and they get on the phone for three hours every night and do all her homework together. Well, that's exciting, okay. (laughs) Over-functioning parents, okay. And then over-controlling parents, kind of make every decision for children so that they don't, they don't grow up being very good at decision making, which is critical for every child to be able to have lots of experience in making good decisions. So here's what we need. Proverbs 24, 3, by wisdom, a house is built and through understanding it is established. How can we have the wisdom to know how to be the kind of parents that we, that we need to be? So over-functioning rescuers and over-controlling parents Maybe what we need to be is more, I'm not sure the right word, but more like a coach, more like a consultant. You see, a coach helps the kids to be able to play the game, but the coach does not play the game, right? Only the kids can play the game, but the coach is there to help them along, to consult with them and kind of show them the way and help them to uh, uh, fulfill the task of that particular uh, sport that they're in. Now, the coach 
or the consultant needs to ask a lot of questions to help the child think it through. Even if the answer is obvious to you, you would think it'd be so obvious, you know, but you want the child to figure it out. You want it to become obvious to them. That's that's your hope, that they would become wise enough so that it would become obvious to them. You want them to hear that wise inside voice in their brain that tells them the right thing to do in every situation. Rather than just hearing the voice of parents telling them what to do. Because you want that parent voice instilled in their brain so that they, can, they will always think through the right thing to do in any given situation. See, you can tell little kids what to do. But when they get older, teenagehood and such, now their brains are developing uh, tremendously. And um, they kind of resist being told what to do as if they're little babies, you know. You want them to make good decisions, not just be told what to do all the time. Because, listen to this. Okay, if all, let's say a teenager, if all they know to do is listen to you tell them what to do every time, when they get to be at a certain age, I'm not sure where that is, but somewhere in the teenagehood, they're going to quit listening to you, and they're going to transfer that to their friends. Now they're going to do whatever their friends tell them to do. And so when illicit drugs are come their way, they're like, oh yeah, sure, I'll do that because uh, you're telling me to do it. And that's what I do. I do what everybody tells me to do. Okay. So we don't want them just responding to what they're told to do. We want them to think. We want them to be good decision makers. We want them to be wise inside so they'll know the right thing to do and follow through on that. Now, Setting appropriate limits is a key part of parenting. Um, good boundaries protect them from the things that they're not ready for yet. But try to allow them to make decisions appropriate to their age. So like with toddlers, I mean, get them started early in this decision-making pro- process. With toddlers, say, it's cold outside. Do you want to wear this coat or that coat? I mean, get them started in the decision-making process. With elementary, you might say, okay, this season, you can play soccer or you can play baseball. You can choose one, but it's your choice. You get to do it. Let them choose and let them follow through on their choice so that by the time they get ready to leave home someday, when they're 18 or 19 years old, which is typical, so that by that time, they will already have a year or two of making all their own decisions so that in the safety of your home, they're making all their own decisions, even though they make some bad ones. They're making all their own decisions so that when they leave home, they will already be skilled at making all their own decisions. Because if they go off to college, you know what dorm rules are at college, right? There are no rules. (laughs) There's not a single rule other than don't do anything illegal. Okay, so I've been around a long time now. I've gotten to see a lot of high school kids graduate and go into workforce or go go to college or whatever. And some of them who did pretty well in high school crashed and burned after that. And it took a year, two years, three years. I didn't do so well myself my first semester in school. Let me just say that. And um, it takes some time to learn how to make, be full, fully fledged adult decision makers. And so if at all possible, let them make as many decisions as possible before they leave home so they don't crash and burn as soon as they do leave home. Now let's see. Where are we here? Okay. Um, now, listen to, listen to this with Jesus. This is in Luke 4. Because Jesus modeled for them how to set boundaries. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. Did you hear that? They tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that's why I was sent. Now, Jesus... All these people were saying, no, Jesus, stay with us. Now, well, you'd think, you know, if, if, if Jesus were in your neighborhood, you'd say, hey, Jesus, can you just stay here? You know, like, you're wonderful. This is great. Everybody's getting healed. Everybody's being successful. This is fabulous. But Jesus said, I don't listen to what people tell me to do. I listen to what God tells me to do. See, Jesus is modeling for them how to set appropriate boundaries and who to listen to in life and how they might live that out in their own lives. With a teenager... For example, instead of saying, get in there and finish your homework, a a coach or consultant might ask, if they're not doing so well in school, might ask, I'm wondering if graduation from high school is really that important to you. You know, (laughs) so, you you know, give it back to them. Let them have it. 
if they make a bad grade, that's not your deal, that's their deal. So show them empathy. Oh man, that's a bummer, you know, so sad about that. But let the consequences be the, um, the discipline. Because that's how it works in the real world. The consequences are the discipline. You don't want to have to discipline them. The consequences, they made a bad grade. They have to live with that. They have to figure out. And then the coach says, well, now what are you going to do? What, what's your, what do you think your strategy is for moving forward at this point? Um, you realize that throughout our history that they didn't call them teenagers back in the old days. They've only been called teenagers in the last few years, you know, just in the last generation or so. In the old days, when somebody's 12, 13, 14, 15, right in there, full-fledged adults, probably before they leave what we call the teenage years, they're already married, having kids, raising a family. It's only in recent years that we kind of delayed adolescence so that we have this teenagerhood. But they are capable of doing a lot and taking care of their own lives, and you see it all around the world already in, in many places where they, they aren't quite as... Um, our type of civilization. My granddad, when he was 12 years old, his dad said, okay, you and your 14-year-old brother, I want you to take all the horses and all the cows and all the family belongings in a Conestoga wagon, and I want you to take them out to Brownfield, Texas, 362 miles away, and we'll meet you there in about a month. Okay, can you imagine that? (laughs) All right, They had to fight off an Indian attack. They had to fight off two sets of robbers that tried to rob them in the middle of the night. And they made it there with all the cattle intact and all the horses intact and the big wagon with all their home goods. They made it out to West Texas to start a new life out in West Texas. Can you imagine sending a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old with that kind of responsibility today? I mean, it doesn't even sound reasonable, does it? But back in that day, that's normal. Because 12-year-olds, they are full-fledged adults. You know, you got to, you know, protect yourself and and, uh, live your whole life and make all your own decisions. That's the way it used to be. So how do we help them grow up to be responsible adults? How do we help them to make really good decisions? You know how people learn to make good decisions? By making bad decisions, right? That's how you make, learn how to make decisions. Now, it's better if they can make bad decisions while they're still at home while they're still in the safety of your home because those decisions have much greater consequences when they're out there on their own. Help them to be responsible. Okay, you ready to move to number three? Here we go. Make respect a dominant value in your home. How do you have a home with respect? How do you turn your home into a place of scream-free parenting? I heard this guy, Jim, he told about all the fights they used to have around their house around bedtime, okay? And he said it was just lots of screaming and yelling. And he said he got this strategy about screaming and yelling at bedtime. He got it from his dad. And his dad got it from his dad who came over from Ireland. He said they were just a screaming family and they've been doing this for generations now. And so every night he would get in there and says, if you don't go to bed in there, there's going to be big trouble around here. And he's, he's raising his voice and all that. And so a friend came up to him one time and said, Jim, do you think it's possible to force someone to sleep? He said, do you think it might be hard for children to fall asleep when you're screaming and yelling at them all night? He said, I'll tell you a little secret I learned. He said, it's a lot easier to wake them up than it is to make them go to sleep. Maybe your energy has been diverted in the wrong direction. And so they came up with a new strategy around the house. He said, eight o'clock is quiet time. Everybody has to be in their room. Go to sleep whenever you want to, but you can't come out of your room because this is quiet time for the parents. But then he said, but I'll be around at six o'clock to wake everybody up for a wonderful, happy new day. Okay. (laughs) So he said, uh, there was no screaming, no yelling. And the kids were thrilled, you know, that they weren't forced to try to sleep with him yelling at them. And uh, it took about two or three days. And before you know it, the kids were like, well, I'm going to bed early tonight because I'm tired. You know? <laughs> and before you know it, they're making their own decision. In Colossians 3, it says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Now, you got to figure out which problems affect you directly and which problems don't affect you directly. Okay, so problems that affect me directly, loud 
noises in the car while I'm driving, right? That affects me directly. I might have a wreck. We might all get killed. Okay, so in our house, the car was quiet time, okay? Because uh, otherwise, this is, it's going to turn out poorly. All right, so we had quiet time. Well, what happens if they're not quiet? There you go. Okay, what happens? <laughs> I know, it happens, right? <laughs> what happens if they're not quiet? Okay, we would pull off into a quiet little neighborhood and say, okay, you know, you can hop out. If you don't want to ride in a quiet car, then you're welcome to just uh, hang out over here for a while. And so we did that from time to time and to just to try to solidify the concept that riding in the car would be a quiet time because that's something that affects me. Now, what doesn't affect me? What's, what's not my problem? What doesn't affect me directly? Losing their clothes or their coat. And you're like, well, well, who's going to pay for that? You know, well, you could say, I used to pay for that, right? Okay, so now it's their, it, now it's their problem. It's not my problem anymore. Now it's, that's their issue. What about bad grades? Bad grades, well, you know, a coach or a consultant might say, you know, you could always do seventh grade one more time. You'd probably do a better job at it second time around. <laughs> what about your bike getting stolen when you left it out? Well, that's what happened to me, okay? When I was 13, I had a really cool bike. I used to ride all around the neighborhood. We lived on a corner, so there were two kind of busy streets on both sides that, that you could see the front door and the back door. So I'd leave it, leave it by the back door sometimes and forget to put it up in the garage. Well, one time I came out, and it was gone. And I said to my parents, oh, no, some, somebody stole my bike. And they're like, hmm, huh? That's, hmm, yuck, yuck, I hate that, you know? <laughs> well, guess what? When I was 38 years old, I finally got a new bike, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, so you don't have to scream as a parent. So, or at least, hopefully. All right. Now, so this uh, counselor said this. Emotional reactivity is our worst enemy. Okay, did you hear that? Emotional reactivity is our worst enemy when it comes to having great relationships. How can we have any influence on our children's decision-making if we don't have an influence on our own? He said, our biggest problem is not our kids, it's ourselves. Okay, let me read that one more time, all right? Emotional reactivity is our worst enemy when it comes to having great relationships. How can we have any influence on our children's decision-making if we don't have an influence on our own? Our biggest problem is not our kids, it's ourselves. In Proverbs 11, it says, the fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. So work on controlling yourself and your personal reactions to the challenges of parenthood because there are going to be plenty of challenges of parenthood. And then when you control yourself, you'll be modeling for your children how to handle situations in life, how to make good decisions as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Instead of screaming, let the natural consequences of life provide the learning for the kids. And as you, but in the, in the midst of that, express empathy. You know, that's terrible. So sorry that happened. For all the bumps in the roads. Now, on a men's retreat one time, we got a men's retreat coming up to Colorado soon. I hope you guys can join us. But uh, we had one a few years ago in Arkansas. And an, an older gentleman asked me to ride with him in his car. And then he said, well, would you drive? Because he said, I don't drive very well. So anyway, I drove his car the whole time. All right. Well, there was a garage there at the house we were staying in. And when I backed out of the garage one time, I got a little close to the edge and I scraped his front fender on the paint of the wood of the garage coming out. Oh man, I felt terrible, you know. Well, anyway, I got out there and I, I was fortunately, it just, it didn't really hurt his pain. It was just paint from the, from the other thing that came out on the wall. So I was able to clean it up and fix it and all that. Now, what if I got home and I told Peggy, I said, um, you won't believe what happened, but I, I scraped Paul's fender of his, of his car on the side of the garage there. And she said, what? You did what? You scraped Paul's fender on the car? Pastor Lee, you're grounded. <laughs> You see, now, see, I was learning, so I learned I got to be a lot more careful when I drive somebody else's car. You know, I got I to gotta really think about this and make sure that I've got clearances on everything. But now I don't care about that. All I, I'm just mad at her now, see? And see, that's what happens with kids. When they don't let, when you don't let consequences be the natural consequences, they're just mad at you and they don't 
learn anything. So let them learn from the natural consequences. Okay, we got one more thing here. Number four, you ready? Show them a pathway to God. Show them a pathway to God. Some parents in our, in our contemporary age say things. I've had some parents say this to me. It's like, you know, I don't want to really push religion on them. I just want to let them wait till they're, they're grown, 20 years old, then let them decide if they want to serve God or not. Now, that's very similar to if you did the same thing with their education. You say, you know, we're just going to wait until they're 20 years old, and then we're going to ask them, would you like to go to kindergarten, okay? <laughs> we're going to start your education now, you know? Dude, we're just going to wait. It doesn't make any sense because they are bombarded with messages in this life about here's how to live life without God. There is no God. Don't believe in God. They are bombarded with messages like that their entire life, millions of those messages. How are you going to bring the education about spiritual things to their lives when they are so bombarded with negative messages about spiritual life, about God, about faith in Jesus Christ. So this is your job as a parent is to show them a pathway to God and to show it to them many times every single day. Um, the greatest gift that you can ever give them is to show them a pathway to love Jesus. In Proverbs 4, it says, I have taught you wisdom and the right way to live. Nothing will stand in your way if you walk wisely, and you will not stumble when you run. In their young lives, they're going to receive all these inputs, and you've got to make sure as parents that you provide the inputs about how to follow Jesus, how to live in the love of God, how to how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. On the back of your outline, Philippians 3.8 says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And the best way to show them how to have a relationship with God is to model it for them. You can tell them all day long, but what really is important, what's going to make the most difference of all is them watching you in your relationship with God. The way they watch you when you pray. The way they watch you when you read the Bible and, and look for answers to life in God's Word. The way they watch you put God as the number one priority in your life every single day. If you put work and soccer and stuff like that as your top three priorities and then God comes in at a, at a late number four, that's what they're going to pick up on, and that is probably how they will live out their lives for the rest of their days. So they're counting on you to model for them what it looks like to live a life dedicated to Jesus Christ. There's a verse in the Bible. In fact, it's the last verse before Jesus. Because, you know, you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament ends in Malachi, and the last verse of Malachi, which is the last verse before 400 years of silence, and then Jesus comes. So you want to know what the last verse before Jesus is? Here it is, Malachi 4, 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. I've got one little story I want to end on today, and this is good. I heard John Orberg tell this story. It's the story of God talking to the angels about children before the foundation of the world, before he had ever created people or anything. And here's the story. Okay, God says, I've got an idea Angels say, what? Okay, and God says, okay, here, it'll work like this. The adults will sign up to take care of a tiny little stranger. And the angels say, well, do they get paid? And God says, no, actually, that little stranger is going to cost them a lot of money. And actually, that little stranger won't even be able to talk at first. It will just cry and scream and smell bad. And they won't, they, it won't even tell you the problem. You'll just have to guess what it is. And then they'll make messes and you have to clean it up. And they'll be so vulnerable that you have to watch them 24-7. And then the little stranger becomes about two, and uh, all of a sudden, they will start saying no and mine and throw tantrums, okay? <laughs> and then a few years later, hormones will start kicking in, and that will make things a little bit crazy, and they will have these dramatic changes up and down, and then they grow up. And just when they are beautiful and interesting and able to contribute, they move away. And so God says, 
So God says, what do you think? And the angels, you know, they're all looking like, well, who's going to tell the big guy, you know, that this is a plan that will never work. And uh, no one's going to sign up for this. So the angels say, so God, uh, who would ever do that? Who would ever sign up for that? And then God gets really excited at this point and says this. Well, they won't even know why. They'll just look at that little body and those little hands and toes, and they'll think that tiny little stranger is the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. And then one day, that little stranger will smile at them, and they'll think they just won the lottery. And one day, that little stranger will say, Mommy and Dada, and those little arms will open up and grab them around the neck and to those parents they will feel like for the first time they understand why arms and hands were created and these children will learn that they are prized and that they belong even before they've ever done in a single thing to earn it and the parent will learn that when they give they receive and when they give the most they receive the most and then one day and then one day God says One day I'm going to tell the human race, I am your father, and you are my daughter, and you are my son. And they will get it. And it will be like they always knew it in their heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that you treasure us. So help us to treasure our kids and to love them and to show them the value and the worth that you have placed in them. And help us in all the decisions about parenting because it's a, it's a challenge. Every day a new challenge. But Lord, you can give us the wisdom that we need to be the kind of parents that you've always wanted us to be. This is our prayer, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey again, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to let you know about a few things before we go. First of all, we hope that you and your family will join us this afternoon from 1.30 to 3.30 as we help to clean up the Colleyville Nature Center. We're going to meet at the parking lot by the playground at the Nature Center there off of Glade Road. Uh, And you and your family can come. We'll provide all the supplies that you need to help with cleanup. And we'll be out in the park and around on the trails for a couple of hours to help beautify our community. You can talk to Pastor Julia if you want to learn more. We hope to see you there this afternoon. Join us for OT Live on April 28th, and we'll transform this into this. We'll turn this into this. The Bible comes alive with OT Live. It is a dynamic and interactive way to learn the major people, places, and events of the Old Testament. We will walk right alongside God's people as we see the big picture of God's story unfold that leads right up to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. We'll have lots of fun, and you'll learn more than you ever thought possible in just a few hours. And OT Live comes with a no boredom guarantee. See the insert in your bulletin for sign-up information. Registration includes lunch and materials from Walk Through the Bible that go along with the event. Don't wait. Sign up today so we can get a good count for lunch and materials. I will see you there April 28th for OT Live. That's all we've got for today. Let's continue our service. All right, let's all stand and sing one more song together. Don't let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Yeah.